Hi, I'm Mike Cutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. Today's module will discuss shredlage applications. Our learning objectives include, one, to differentiate between shredlage processing of corn silage and other processing procedures. Second, describe the nutritional and physical aspects of shredlage. And then finally, explain the important harvesting and feeding characteristics of shredlage. First, let's talk about the definition, what is shredlage? Basically, shredlage is a new technology in which we are longitudinally ripping the forage. This increases the surface area. This is accomplished by a different style of roller, which you'll see briefly here in a minute, and also different speeds between the rollers to actually rip this feed apart. Because of this technology, we can actually go to a longer length. So the pieces of some of the corn silage is actually the size of alfalfa stem, which means one half, 1.25 inches in length, or we're chopping at a 1.25 theoretical length of chop, or about 30 millimeters. Uh, obviously, we're trying to replace alfalfa or, or small grain or even straw in the TMRs here to maintain optimal particle size. The rind, which is kind of the pith of the plant, is completely opened up. We continue to smash the corn kernels, and the feed appears to be a more softer and fluffier feed, although pack and densities are still optimal. Thanks to the University of Wisconsin, uh, shows us a picture of the two rollers. The one on your right is called KP. We'll call that kernel processing. And we refer to that pretty much as the conventional type system used on many farms. The roller on the left, you can see, has a different style and shape to it that causes the shredding of the particle to occur. Uh, this is a fairly new roller that's just being implemented on some of the new processors in the field at this point. This picture shows the actual comparison of the study that you'll hear in just a minute from the Wisconsin group. Uh, on the left is your shredlage, and I think you can physically see it is a longer particle compared to the KP or kernel processed on the right. These are fresh samples, and you can see very quickly there is a different length to this chopped corn silage. Another trick you can do is actually when you're harvesting the corn silage is to take several handfuls of the corn silage, put it in a pail of water or a tub of water, and float it. And what happens is all the heavier corn goes to the bottom, and that is what's pictured here. So you can see on the shredlage uh, corn silage on the left, uh, a, a bit finer particle size to the, to the corn grain compared to the kernel processing on the right. And in our evaluation, both of these should be processed even more. We would like to actually smash the kernel to even a greater extent to ensure uh, availability of the starch in the rumen and in the total tract to avoid loss in feces as far as that goes. But again, remember, a great technique to actually evaluate what's coming in from the field by floating the, the fresh corn silage. You cannot, you cannot do this to fermented corn silage. It will not separate. Throughout this entire presentation, we'll be talking about the Penn State separator box. So we thought we'd visualize a picture for you. Pictured here is the three-box system. There is also a fourth box as well. If you have the fourth box, it would be between the, the, the first box on your left and the second box. It's about 1,100 micron, a particle size. So we'll be using the three-box system in our discussions here today and also referring to the four-box. The second box is about a quarter of an inch hole opening, and the third box on your right uh, would be about three-quarter of an inch opening. Uh, the long box on the right is considered part of the long fiber. However, when we look at effective fiber, we add the top to top two boxes from the right together to give us an index of effective fiber. Here's some data from the University of Wisconsin, uh, one of the first studies done with Shredlage. Uh, they took the Penn State box. You can see they are using the four-box system here, and you see a picture on the bottom. Uh, there is more material, as you can see, in that box under the Shredlage compared to the KP. You will notice in this comparison, we have really moved uh, a lot of the material from the second box to the top box. I think that's an important consideration in terms of the physical property of the corn silage, and I think think we'll have more discussion and research as this technology continues to grow. 
The Wisconsin group then did a lactation study. Uh, these cows and were initiated after 100 days in milk, so we're off of peak milk at this point. And you can see that there is a trend, almost statistically significant, at the 0.07 level of more milk coming from the cows fed the shredlage. Diets were identical. They were balanced. And again, you can go to Wisconsin and get these diets, but they're a very well-balanced diet. You can see fat-corrected milk, which stands for FCM, uh, per unit of dry matter, also known as feed efficiency. Uh, really no differences in feed efficiency. On energy-corrected milk, you can see, again, a trend, if you wish, slightly higher for the shredlage here. And again, no differences on feed efficiency using energy-corrected milk. Interesting looking at the lactation on these cows. In the uh, blue line is the shredlage. You can see that uh, these cows actually, once they went on the shredlage, went up in milk production. They're after peak production. So you can see they went up a little bit and they held a very high persistency. So you can see that the real benefits on the shredlage diets occurred after eight weeks. Unfortunately, they ran out of corn silage and could not extend this to go even further. It'd be interested to see uh, 10 weeks. 12 weeks, 16 weeks if this trend or this difference continued. The red curve is a kernel processed, and this is a very typical persistency uh, drop on cows. So the blue one is, is just a much more persistency improvement in terms of milk production, and you can see these lines are really separating here. You can see by week eight, we had over a four-pound difference. So uh, interesting to see if this would have even went wider. Looking at the, the dynamics of the nutrients, in this case starch, you can see they did an in situ starch digestibility at 12 hours. You can see the shredlage is much faster. Uh, so it, it's a faster starch. Now you're going to have to remember that. That has pluses and minuses in terms of effects on rumen digestibility, pH, total tract digestibility. So at 12 hours, you can see the shredlage is a faster starch. Now part of that could be related to the technology. Part of it could also be we saw a physical difference in the, the sizing of the corn and we looked at the picture a bit earlier. At 24 hours, you can see these lines draw close together, and you'd expect this to occur because of starch digestibility in the rumen goes very, very quickly. Another important number is looking at the NDF digestibility, thinking that we are ripping uh, the stock a bit more. We were expecting to see perhaps a slightly higher advantage to the shredlage. We don't see any differences here. This is 24-hour incubation. You can see uh, the difference here is, is basically none at all at this point. A little surprise thinking we might see some improvement because of the physical nature of the corn stock itself. We then went and picked up a sample out in the field in Wisconsin. We're going to show you two field studies now. So we're leaving the university, and we're looking at a, a large herd of 1,000 cows uh, southeast of Madison. And we got a sample, and we took it back to our labs and shook it out. You can see 44% on the top box. You can see 27 in the middle and 29 in the bottom box. So certainly, again, reflecting very similar to what the Wisconsin uh, research data was presented here just a bit earlier. Let's do a close-up of each of those boxes. Here's your top box again. You can see how this material is actually shredded and pulled apart at this stage of the game, really reflecting that technology. The middle box, you can see, still has some fairly long pieces in it, point that should catch your eye as it does mine, and that is the presence of uh, kernels of corn. And we would like to see that not occurring in the second box. We did a close-up and pulled that corn out of this small sample on that plate, and you can see we don't have it all, but you can see a number of uh, kernels that perhaps are going to be too large, especially if the dry matter of this corn size starts getting above, say, a 33, 34, 35 percent dry matter, and then, of course, depending on what type of hybrid we'd have as well in terms of the hardness of the kernel in terms of its appearance coming through the total track. Here's the bottom box, and again, you can see still presence of a fair amount of, of corn kernel in the bottom box as well. We then will show you another sample from Illinois. We had a field day in which some 30 corn side samples were brought in by producers, and in my estimation, this was the winning sample from near Ithingham, Illinois. Uh, you'll notice that we had 13% on the top box, about 69% in the middle box, and about 18% in the bottom box. You also note that we shake out about 500 grams of material when we shake out corn silages. Uh, Halage is usually a little bit less because of more difficulty to separate the particles. 
Let's take a close look at the top box. Uh, here you can see a very precise chop, uh, exactly three-quarter inch theoretical length of chop is where most farmers are at. Notice the, the nice uniform chop, uh, sharper blades or uh, knives probably in this field harvester because we see less uh, ratting of the, of the silage at this stage of the game compared to some of the other samples we saw a bit earlier. Here's my middle box, and it's the biggest middle box we've ever had, almost 70%. So if you add those two numbers together, you can see lots of effective fiber in here. You can see one corn kernel or partial corn kernel at about 7 o'clock there, otherwise very uniform material. And here comes the bottom box, and you can see we have really pulverized this corn. You can still see pieces of corn in there, but you can see uh, very little evidence of a whole kernels at this stage of the game. This is an awfully good job of processing. So let's make some comparisons. And I think as listeners, you'll have to think this through because I, too, am saying interesting how we shift. And this is exactly what the Wisconsin data reflected as well. If you look at the uh, Illinois farm data versus the Wisconsin farm data, you can see we actually had less material in the bottom box. So we had long, more long material in the top two boxes. Uh, these new rollers are probably going to cost in the range of $30,000 to implement, to put into your machine. Question of power when you're shredding has come up, and we don't have a good figure on that at this stage of the game. And not all choppers can take these new innovative rollers. So again, that is going to be another factor as well. So lots of food for thought in terms of where this technology is and what kind of acceptance and utilization we're going to have in the field. But the bottom line comes back to this slide. This is the Illinois guidelines for a TMR. And so it says, regardless of how we're processing corn silage, you'll notice our guidelines on the bottom is for three-quarter inch theoretical length chop kernel processed corn silage. So you can see why our sample from Ethiopian, Illinois scored so highly. But the bottom line is a TMR. In other words, we need to have somewhere around 10% in the top box, somewhere greater than 40% in the middle box. Those two boxes need to exceed, at least by our standards, over 50%. The third box uh, should be less than 30%, the bottom box less than 20%. So again, if you've got a three-box system, you just add those last two numbers on the right together to get the job done. So there's the bottom line. And so the question is, will shredlage, will it improve the dynamics or allow a farmer to reach these goals using less expensive feeds or different feed ingredients? So what's our take-home message? Well, there's no question shredlage is going to increase the percent of long particles in the top box, certainly replacing or uh, substituting for baled hay, baled straw, and other small grain forage particles. The real question is the proportion in the second box. And it appears that that is reduced with the shredlage compared to traditional processed corn silage and moves it up. Is that a plus or is that a minus? Will that change dry matter intakes? Will it have an impact in terms of performance long term? Regardless of how we do this, the kernel processing must be done correctly. And we think the corn kernels really have to be crushed at this stage of the game. And certainly there will be more research both done on farm and in university to determine what is the optimal process of corn silage in the future as we see more corn silage coming into dairy rations here in the United States. Well, that concludes our module. Thanks. Have a great day.